guys, it's so good to see you again. Totally. And, and and look at this. Look at this. Her Infernal Majesty, I don't know why they say she doesn't like me. Because look, she left me this totally awesome t-shirt to wear. I mean, isn't it awesome? It's really, really comfy. And just so, so nice. And like blue is totally my color. Yeah, I love wearing blue. Anyway, you can get these t-shirts like this one that I'm wearing right now on the Black Khaki Press shop. So her Infernal Majesty really has some taste. She might be a bit bad tempered, but hey, cool. I mean, nice. Yeah. So you should, you should totally, totally go over there and check them out because you want to look, you want to look cool. That's the way to go. Anyway. Anyway, what are we doing today? Well, you know how last week that her ladyship did a Daniel Defoe novel called Mole Flanders? Yeah. Well, today we're having a look at a book that is sort of, I'll say tangentially, um, to that because we're not looking at something that is based upon Mole Flanders, but we're looking at something that's based on other writing of Daniel Defoe. That is Robinson Crusoe with the book Foe. Now this has a green cover, so it's probably going to disappear. Foe by J.M. Curtsy. And Foe is, well, James Curtsy, to start out with, James Curtsy is a South African writer and he is what is known as a post colonial writer. So I kind of got to wrap to you a little bit about what a post colonial writer is. So, colonial countries are those that were settled by European nations. So, a lot of African countries. South American countries, there are Southeast Asian countries, uh, much of South Asia, so we're talking about India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and Australia and Canada. And I'm not sure if America counts as post-colonial anymore. I, I, I don't actually think so. Maybe in certain circumstances, but not a lot, given that they're now a major industrial empire maker. But New Zealand does. So former, colo former colonies, former British or European colonies, because not all of these are British colonies, so the British were everywhere for a certain degree of time. But Post-colonial writing is writing from the colonies back to the colonizer. So the way that colonialism works is that the dominant European nation, the more technologically advanced nation, imposes its will, its structure onto the colonized country. So it imposes the narrative. It says, this is how this is, this is who you are, and this is how we are going to interpret you. Post-colonial writing is from the colonies putting their hand up and saying, hey, 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 dude, dude, we have narratives of our own. We have a story and an interpretation of the past that we would like to give you in place of the one you're giving us. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a bottom up instead of colonialism, which is top down, top laying down the law and imposing that on all levels. This is the bottom speaking back. Now, post-colonial writing is particularly uh, pertinent when you are talking about writers who come from the local indigenous populace. So writers, African writers or um, Indian writers, 
but or indigenous writers but post-colonialism also works from settler communities so jm curtsy is south african but he's white south african um he's not black south african so he is talking from a settler version of the experience back to the other culture so even the settler culture can be dominated from the top by the colonial over the top and and it takes effort to reassert the voice of the colony itself so when you look at australian writing you can see that happening with someone like patrick white you can see that happening with richard flanagan there's a whole load of writers that um laura has done that are post-colonial writers especially uh, most certainly kim scott the indigenous writer i think she's going to do more indigenous writers in the future but that is post-colonialism it's the colonies talking back to the mother or father country so where does that get us for this well after a whistle top tour of what is post-colonialism and there are great books on that i'll link a couple below to let you find out this is a retelling of the story of robinson crusoe robinson crusoe of course being a retelling of a story of a real man who was lost on an island not for as long as robinson crusoe was but an adventure on an island that daniel defoe turned into his novel now i think her ladyship said she wasn't going to read that one because she read that at university and didn't like him anyway and so we spent time with Mont flanders instead i don't blame her i also read it at university i didn't like robinson crusoe either but this one i've read a few times and in this one what happens is robinson crusoe and friday are still on the island but the story isn't picked up until a woman called susan barton appears on the island also a castaway having been thrown off the boat when the crew mutinied they saw her as the captain's slut so they chucked her overboard now susan barton then comes and tells the first part the the book, whole book is told in four parts the first part appears to be a contemporary telling of events of what is happening as it's happening but we don't find out until the end of that section that this is susan barton has written this account of her life as a castaway to entice the writer daniel foe to take their story and make the money because she sees this as like she's going to sell her story in the early 18th century version of a you know sell your story to the tabloids and make a fortune and so she hopes to use this story to be able to make her fortune and to set friday free now this all seems perfectly fine except that susan barton gets very caught up in the notion of truth and I think you will find that um, as, as we looked at the, as, as her ladyship looked at last week's book, the idea of truth and storytelling are not exactly easily combined. She is very, she's very, very um, obsessed with the idea of foe only telling the truth. Crusoe died when he left the island. Uh, when he left the island, he died on board the ship. F she has Friday, and they are living in lodgings that Foe has 
hired for them so that he can have them on hand to tell him more of the story. Though it's only Susan who can tell the story because Friday is mute. Friday is mute. Whether he is mute because he has been um, made mute by slavers, which is Susan's interpretation of what is happening, but Friday is mute and Susan spends a great deal of time and effort interpreting Friday and being frustrated with Friday and imposing her narrative over the top of Friday. She talks a lot in her in these letters that she then writes to to Daniel Foe about what is the mystery of Friday. You know, um, why, you know, and, and she's very keen to hold Friday to keep him, to determine exactly what happens to him. And she is a character that we can really read very much as that colonizer. Um, Curtsy coming from South Africa. So in, in, in South Africa, you have actually more than one level of colonialism. So on the base level, you have the indigenous inhabitants of South Africa, the black South Africans. This is Friday. Over the top of that, you have the Afrikaans, the Dutch descendants or the Dutch colonials who came to South Africa. That's Caruso. And then over the top of that, you then have the English, which is Susan Barton. So here she is as another as a level over the top. So you have a, the 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 colonized, the kept down by the people who originally came to the island, Caruso, who is then enforcing himself and and placing himself as the master of this, which he does on his island by building terraces and refusing. Speak to, to explain anything. And then over the top, you have Susan Barton, who is constantly asking that why, questioning why, and wanting to impose a narrative over the whole lot that will create a, a um, seamless whole. So to create that colonial narrative over the top of what is already there, to explain away what you find in a way that satisfies her. Doesn't satisfy anyone else. That's not the point. It satisfies her. And then she gets very cranky that when she's challenged in the third part of the book by Daniel Foe about, but, you know, the narrative, you, you, you're giving me part of it and I need a bigger to create a bigger narrative and, and I want to stretch the story in this direction and make it the story of the lost child and the search for the child because that's what she was doing in Brazil, was searching for a child, which is how she got shipwrecked in the first place. And then the finding the child. And this becomes very, very, it, 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 it she finds herself losing control of the narrative and she does not like this. She does not like having her narrative control challenged. And the other thing that Defoe does is he offers a different way to read Friday. Is Friday just a dependent slave? Is he a helpless child as Susan Barton would like him to be made? Is he dependent upon her? Because that's another great one of the over colonial narratives is that, oh, we had to do this because the native inhabitants of these places could not look after themselves. And Fur challenges that, that narrative of, well, Friday it could, could leave. He clearly has, he clearly has preferences. He clearly has choices. Susan is constantly berating him as lazy, as stupid, because he cannot speak and because he does not wish to conform to her ideal of where he should be. 
in her ideal, he is at the bottom of the heap and therefore he should, he should eat less than her. He should work harder than her. He should not have the bed or the clothing that she has so that she can maintain her status. And Friday continually subverts her desires of him staying where he should. During the second part of the book, when they end up finding themselves living in Defoe's house, which he has abandoned because he owes debts, Friday finds one of his wigs and an academic robe, and he dances underneath the robe. He's not wearing anything. He dances and sings and is entirely, entirely absent from her and unreachable. She's constantly trying to reach him, but he does not wish for her to pluck the, 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 the heart of him out. He is contained. He is with her more or less for as long as he wants to. There is nothing. She is also very terrified that if he was accountable, that he may eventually start, that may wake him up, wake up in him one day and suddenly she becomes food. So she tells a lot of stories. She's telling a lot of stories that work for her that reinforce her prejudices, but they're put over the top of this silent witness to everything that happened, who has their own internal world. As we see, we see clearly he has a very rich internal world and he refutes by his very existence, her desire to put a narrative on top of him. And so this becomes, this is a really fascinating book. It is a book about who gets to tell stories, Do, does telling a story erase another person's agency? Is telling a story a form of truth telling or is it just another way to tell ourselves? And what, what do you say about people who really feel that they have a right to impose a story on others. Now, this is a post-colonial book, but I think that you can see the idea of storytelling and who gets the power of storytelling and who gets the power of imposing their story over others. And it is a power. It is an absolute power. It wasn't that way. It is this way. How many of us have heard those sorts of stories all over the place? That power and who gets to wield it is runs through the whole thing. And the fact that no story is entirely wiped away, you can't wipe away their story, their, their, their presence, their existence is a silent or deathless is a, is a silent deathless scream into the void, which is what you see in the final part of the book. Friday gets in a bizarre way, the final silent word of this book. He, unlike the others at the end of the book is interacted with, but also not silent in the way that they are. Ultimately, ultimately, the writer gets the final word. The writer gets the final word, and that is why there is such a tussle between them. Friday is being taught after a manner to write, to express himself, which I think is why Friday gets the last bizarre word in the book but the writer gets the word. The writer is the one who gets the last word. That is, that is enormous power. It is, it is an enormous power. But the power of storytelling, the power of who gets to tell what story is something very much um, explored in this book. And I, it's only about 150 pages. It doesn't take that long to read. 
It is a really great book if you want to try any post-colonial writing to start it out with, if you're interested in that, if you're interested in writing that comes out of Africa. It's another great one to have a look at. Remember, guys, check out cool T-shirts and the other, the other cool stuff available. Peace out, and I will see you in my next video. Peace. If you would like to support this channel, come across to the Black Hockey Press website, www.blackhockeypress.com.au, where you will find books and other writing services to help with your writing.